What's up guys, welcome back to a brand new episode of Bonsai U. This time around we're gonna be working on this Chuhin or medium sized Colorado blue spruce. Okay, so before we jump into wiring and styling this tree, I wanna tell you a little bit about this particular bonsai. So this is actually my old man's tree, my dad's tree. So when I got into bonsai when I was about 13 years old, it took about a year after I got into it before my dad jumped in with me as like a father-son hobby. So we did that all through my high school years into my university years, and then I went off to Japan right after university to start my apprenticeship. So he continued to do bonsai as a hobby all the way up until today, and this is actually one of his personal trees right here. So I picked this tree up in Denver, Colorado a few years back from a collector friend of mine out there, brought it back to East Tennessee, and my dad fell in love with the tree and wanted to buy it. So he's been working on this tree for the last couple of years. He repotted it about a year and a half ago. So it's been in this pot for enough time to have settled in and actually be in a healthy state to be able to work on it, which is what we're gonna be doing this time around. So as a birthday present earlier this year, I told my dad I would style this tree for him. Now it's been a few months since then, and I'm finally getting a little bit of time here at the garden to actually get my hands on the tree. So I'm excited to style this up and then take it back over to him in Knoxville, which is about a three hour drive from here and show him what I've done with the plant. So I wanna take you guys along for the ride in styling this tree and explaining my thought process in how to build the branch structure and the initial design of this Colorado spruce bonsai. So let's jump into it. Okay, so first things first, when I potted this tree about a year and a half ago, I had a sort of initial design in mind, which is why it's planted on this particular angle. So when I'm working with raw Yamadori like this, what I'm trying to do is figure out what are the flaws, what are the features of the tree, and then we're gonna to try to show off those features and hide the flaws to as large of a degree as we can. Now if you take a look at the base of the tree here, there's some really interesting deadwood features. I wanted to show these off from the front view of the tree because they're very delicate, very intricate, and very beautiful. The only issue is, is that they're very fragile as well because they're so thin. So in repotting this tree a year and a half ago, we took extra care not to break these pieces of dead wood off and over the last couple of years we've maintained these by painting them with lime sulfur cleaning them with a toothbrush and water a couple times a year to keep the gunk off of them to keep them from rotting and also applying a little bit of wood hardener to them as well so what i want to do today to start with is get the moss off the base of this tree here so you can see those features a little bit more and then we're going to select some branches and place those branches in place and create a new primary line to the tree now if you notice the base of the tree i'm going to spin this around a little bit here the way this is potted, it's tilted quite far to the front. This is actually gonna be the front of the tree to show off those features here at the base. So I potted it in a way where it's leaning quite far to the front so that we can build the apex kind of coming towards us. When you're building a bonsai, you wanna have the apex leaning towards you slightly because it creates a sort of domineering effect with the tree. The, the tree appears bigger than it actually is. Now when potting this tree initially, I also had to take into consideration the placement of the branches or where the branches actually emanate from the trunk. Now, ideally, the best situation is for the branches to either come out directly from the side of the trunk or from the rear, so you can whip those branches around and put them in the proper position. If the branches are coming out of the front of the trunk, you end up seeing the shoulder of the branch where it actually exits from the trunk and it doesn't really tend to look very beautiful. There are some exceptions to that, but as a general guideline, general rule of thumb, if the branch is coming out of the back side of the trunk or out of the side, you can whip it around and put it in the right spot without exposing too much of that shoulder. Well, you'll notice here if I spin this to the side that our primary branch down here at the bottom actually comes out almost directly out of the front of the trunk. The reason that I potted it this way really was to show off that interesting deadwood at the base and also the nice wide nabari as well. So in this case, it was more of a compromise in you know, looking at the major features of the tree and really trying to show those off while dealing with the flaws of the tree, that branch coming out of the front of the tree at a later time when we actually style the plants. It's gonna be somewhat of a challenge to work with that today, but I think we'll be able to manipulate the softer branches here into place to hide the fact that it's coming out of the front and create a nice sort of stair step pad for that first directional branch on the left side of the tree. Now again, when you're building a tree, we're trying to draw your eyes to the features of the tree, which in this case is gonna be the bottom sort of third or half of the tree down here. And you'll notice that the apex is way up there on the top, you know, protruding out to the left. It's actually drawing your eye up and away from these features down here. So in order to draw your eye back down to this area, we're gonna be shortening this tree significantly. 
So now that we kind of have a sense of what I want to do with this tree and why it was potted on this particular angle, the next step is going to be to go through and clean out all of the unnecessary branches and all of the unnecessary foliage. So let's do that next. So let's take a look at the base here. I mentioned earlier that I wanted to get the moss off the base of the tree. So whenever you have moss running up the trunk like this, it's really not an ideal situation, particularly when you're dealing with trees that have flaky bark, like this one right here. This is going to stay moist underneath and essentially rot off that bark. It can cause long-term damage to the tree and also just general aesthetic damage by making that bark essentially disappear. So we wanna get this moss off of here. Now there are a couple of ways to do that. We can do it with a tweezer set like this. Uh, the only issue in doing that with the tweezers is that you might actually end up pulling off the bark as you do this. So in the event that that is happening as you're peeling away with the tweezers, if you notice that the bark is coming off, what you can do is actually paint vinegar diluted by about 50% with water on top of the moss. That'll kill the moss off and then the moss will eventually just slough off on its own without damaging the bark. So I'm going to try peeling this away with the tweezers here first and if that doesn't work then we'll paint on some vinegar and water mixed together. It looks like we're going to be okay just peeling this off without painting on the vinegar. I think we'll be all right here. So you can see a very different coloration between where the moss was originally here where we peeled it off and where there was no moss. This is staying completely wet underneath that moss. So we definitely need to get that off of there. Now, if you've got lichen on the trunk, that's a completely different story. Lichen tend to stay quite dry. They actually thrive in a little bit more of a dry environment. So leaving the lichen on the trunk really isn't that big a deal. And it can actually add a really nice sense of age to the tree and naturalness to the tree as well. So if you do have lichen on the trunk, I wouldn't worry about removing that. I think uh, keeping that and promoting that actually adds uh, a nice extra element to the bonsai. You also notice here we got a little bit of uh, sort of pop-up kusamono. Uh, you know, even here at a professional bonsai nursery, we don't always have time to keep everything weeded properly. So I'm going to remove all of this grass here as well because it's not really doing much for us here. This will be nice if we have a little accent plant off to the side when this tree gets displayed, but I don't want to have that grass actually in the pot here. All right, so let's start looking at the branches by talking about the first primary branch right here off to the left side of the tree. Now you'll notice that there's a little bit of back budding going on here. There are a few buds out here at the end, but overall it's a pretty weak branch for the most part. I actually don't think that this is going to survive really well and be usable in the design. So I think our best option in this case is actually to remove this branch right here. Now the cool thing is right at the base of this, we actually have some really soft, nice, very, very strong foliage, very healthy foliage right up here that will be able to use to sort of replace this in the long run right here. So I think what we're gonna do is go ahead and remove this right here. And another thing too, is that we've got this branch to the rear. that has got a lot more budding on it. It's a lot healthier of a branch. It's actually emanating from the backside of our first sort of primary branch here. And we can actually take this and whip this back around towards the front to still give us the length that we need here for that first directional primary branch. Now I mentioned earlier that, you know, the first branch here emanates from the front side of the tree and then whips back around to the back side by eliminating this one here and taking the one from the rear and whipping it back around. That'll actually give us a much tighter, more compact look to that first directional branch. So let's do that first and then we'll see what we have left on the branch that we can work with here. All right, so we've zoomed out a little bit from that first branch. You can see that we've got a dead section here coming up off the top. We've got what's going to be our primary branch. We've got other soft, very healthy growth back here, soft, healthy growth here as well. But this gin right here that's emanating from the top of our primary branch is just a little bit long in my opinion. So I'm gonna go ahead and break that back. Now if you notice here too, just above that, we've got another branch here that's also a gin, it's completely dead. Uh, from the trunk all the way out to the end here. So the overlap of these two is a little bit strange. So I'm actually gonna break that one back as well. Now, when I'm creating gins on a tree like this, a spruce, for example, or a pine, I tend to like to leave some of the old bark on the gin rather than stripping it all the way back to the base. I think it gives it a, a much more natural appearance. And I don't necessarily want this to come to a single point here at the end. I'd prefer it to be a little bit jagged. It gives it a, also a better sense of you know, naturalness, for example. 
Uh, if you see branches broken in nature, they do taper out to the end, but they tend to actually be quite jagged right at the very end of the branch. So I want to make sure that we sort of keep that theme throughout the entire tree here. All right, so you get that one knocked back. Now let's knock this guy back here a little bit as well. Now typically I'll grab pieces of the branch from the front side and then peel away so that from the front, the viewer is better able to see these striations in the branch that I'm creating. If you peel from the back side, you end up taking too much off sometimes and it just looks a little bit strange. So I wanna leave some of that collar of bark around the back side, peel away from the front, and then over time, this will weather and look quite natural. Right now it's gonna have a pretty loud appearance to it just because of the contrast of that new wood that I've exposed relative to the old bark. But as it ages and weathers, it's gonna look much, much nicer. Let's shorten this guy up a little bit here as well. It's just a little too, too long and too loud. So whipping the tree back around to the front side here, this again is the main branch that's coming out of the front of the trunk. Now you'll notice here we've got a lot of really nice foliage coming off to the left side here, but we also have this relatively large branch that's coming back to the right. I actually think that this is gonna be a little bit too difficult to whip down and around. It'll actually look a little bit contrived, I think, if we do that. So in the case of this branch, I'm actually gonna cut this off in favor of just using this growth here. Now this has a lot of buds all over it. It's got a lot of foliar density to it. So I don't see any issue in removing this branch in terms of weakening this area of foliage here. As a matter of fact, it'll probably draw some energy back into this area and cause it to grow more strongly next year. So let's go ahead and remove this branch as well. All right, now everything, again, that we're gonna do on here, I'm gonna turn into a gin. So I want a whole bunch of those little deadwood features all over the tree so we can keep that theme throughout the plant. If we cut anything back flush, it's gonna be pretty obvious that that was man-made. It was a man-made cut. So I wanna hide that to as large a degree as possible. Now that we've removed that, we can also take a look here. I don't know if you guys can see this very well. Let's see. So this branch right here, it's coming up out of the top and actually going back in towards the trunk. Regardless of whatever species you're working on, you wanna get rid of growth like this right here that's growing back in towards the trunk. We want everything growing out and away, somewhat down depending on the species and depending on the style of the tree, but somewhat down, out and away from the trunk rather than back up and in towards the interior. All right, so let's spin the tree around towards the back side here. Now you'll notice in this area on the back of the trunk, we've got a lot of foliage coming out of one particular spot on the trunk, which is pretty normal with actually most species of trees, but particularly with spruce, if something gets broken or damaged on the tree, a profusion of buds will emanate from that particular point and you'll get a lot of branching from that particular area. So this can come in handy when you're doing massive bends, for example, on a spruce like this, it'll back bud like crazy, which is great, but it can also cause a little bit of a problem because you'll end up with swelling in certain areas if you don't sort of mitigate the number of buds that are there. Uh, or eliminate some of the buds that are there to mitigate that from happening. So in the case of this uh, particular area of the tree, you'll notice that we've got this branch here, which is quite a thick branch. It's got a decent amount of foliage out here at the end, but we've got all of this really soft growth that has a lot more interior foliage, so back buds on it. Now, in a case like this, what I would prefer to do here is actually get rid of this heavier, longer branch. Even though that's a lot of foliage that we could use for depth, this stuff right here is way more usable, way more beneficial, so I think we're gonna end up using this. And this is something I see quite often in the US and sometimes in Europe as well, is that folks will tend to try to utilize the really heavy branches and manipulate those, put a lot of motion and bends in them to get them in the right spot. Whereas I really think that it's a better and more sustainable approach if you cut back to softer growth like this, eliminate heavy stuff, and then rebuild the foliar density with that softer branching. It's more sustainable in the long run. You can put more motion and interest in those branches. And because they're younger, they tend to back bud even much more easily than something like this right here, which is a little bit older. So let's go ahead and remove this guy right here. Now I'm gonna take out a little bit of the crotch growth right at the base so we can see the structure a little bit better and get the wire in there more easily. So next let's take a look at the top portion of the tree right here. I mentioned at the beginning that this is way too tall and it really draws your eye away from the base of the tree, which is the main feature. So we have a few options up here in terms of how we create and build an apex. So first and foremost, we could take this and put a lot of motion in it and sort of whip it back around on itself, but I think that that's gonna look a little bit contrived relative to the base of the tree, which has kind of a nice soft 
elegant line to it. So I wanna keep that theme throughout the tree. So I think the next best option would be to actually eliminate at least a portion of this up here or turn it into a gin feature. So we have a few options here, as I just mentioned. If you notice, we've got a lot of side branching coming out in this area. We could simply gin this right here, maybe build the apex out of something a little lower here. Maybe we could come one iteration further down, perhaps build the apex out of this, gin everything above that. We could come down even further into this area gen all of this and keep something like this as the apex. I think that when you're considering something like this, you have to keep in mind the general direction of the tree and also sort of the movement in the primary line of the tree, as I just mentioned. So the direction of the tree is actually moving to the left with that primary branch on the left side of the tree. Up here at the top, this section of the trunk is also moving left, but we need it to come back to the right and then back to the left again so we have some interesting motion up at the top. So using this branch on the left side of the tree, I think it's gonna draw your eye too far out to the left. Again, we need that whip back to the right. I think if we utilize something like this, this high up, it's still gonna feel like it's too high up on the trunk. So I think the best option in this case is actually to come down to this middle branch right here that whips back to the right, we'll whip it again back to the left to create that rounded apex, and we'll gin everything above that. So let's do that. Now here what I'm gonna do with each of these branches that we're removing, I'm gonna turn all of this into a gin up here. So I'm gonna leave stubs on all of these to begin with and then peel all of those back. We may end up taking a lot of these out or we may end up adding some wire to some of these in the end to make them a little bit more interesting and sort of a continuation of the line of the uh, primary line of the trunk on the tree further down. But in any case, I wanna leave a lot of these features on here to begin with. And then we always have the option to shorten those or manipulate them into place if they don't fit. So as I get closer down to the branch down here that's going to become our new apex, again, I don't wanna to get too close in terms of peeling the bark off here. So I'm gonna leave quite a bit of this old bark down in this area, just for the safety and health of this branch. And also aesthetically, I think it looks a little bit more natural than wringing this at the base and then peeling down to a flat area there. So once we get this done, I'm gonna go back through and actually break off the ends of all of these so they don't look so flat cut which will give it a, a little bit more of a natural appearance as well. All right, so again, this looks a little bit loud and bright compared to the rest of the tree, but what we'll do is let this dry out for a couple of weeks and then we'll go back through and burn this with a little blow torch, like a creme brulee torch that you would use in the kitchen. If I were to burn it right now, it's so wet that it's not really gonna do anything to it. So I wanna let it dry out for a couple of weeks before we do that. So that takes care of the gin at the top here. Now what I'm gonna do is go throughout the rest of the tree, clean out the stuff that we don't need, cutting out crotch growth, for example, cleaning out the undersides of the branches, creating kind of an alternating branch structure on the primary branches, and then we'll get into wiring this tree.
All right, so now that we've got the wire on the entire tree, I'm gonna start placing the branches. Just wanna to mention too, before I do that, that I didn't wire every single branch on this tree. I only wired the primary branches and a few of the secondary branches that I felt would be out of position once I put the primary branches in place. So overall, I probably have only about, we'll say 30%, maybe even less than that, 25% of all of the branches. If you include all of the little secondary and tertiary branches, only about 25 to 30% wired, somewhere in that range. So when I'm wiring a spruce like this too, I'm trying to keep the wire from you know, crushing the foliage as much as possible. So as I'm applying the wire, as I get out into the areas where you have a lot of needles, I'll wiggle the wire back and forth. So it kind of opens up and wiggles its way in between the foliage rather than smashing the foliage. So just keep that in mind when you're working with something like a spruce or a needle juniper or any tree with really sharp needles like this. It's a good technique to help you get the wire into the branch between the foliage. All right, so we're gonna start with the lowest branch right here. I'll turn it to the side so you can see what we're working with here. What I wanna do is whip this around towards the front a little bit in this area to create that first directional branch. Now I used a uh, size eight wire on this and we've actually doubled up out here with a size, uh, what is that, a size 12 uh, on the secondary branches here. So that should be enough to bring this around towards the front. As I mentioned earlier, when you're bending a Colorado blue spruce like this, the really cool thing is that on the tensile side of the bend, so you've got a compression side and you've got the stretch side, the tensile side on the outside. On the tensile side on a spruce like this, you're gonna get all sorts of back budding because you're creating kind of micro tears along that area. So next spring, as this thing pops out, we should get a lot of additional popping all throughout the backside of this branch. And if I put motion in the secondary branches as well, we should get quite a bit of popping in those areas too. So as I'm placing this here, I'm looking to create pretty much a flat bottom pad here. Everything fanned out basically like a hand in a hand shape. And that'll get us sort of a basic structural setup for the future development of this tree. All right, now to compensate for this open space that we have here, I'm gonna take this branch down and around to fill that area. But like I said, we'll get back budding all along the backside of this branch come spring. So we won't necessarily need to keep this branch down here in the long run, but for the sake of showing you how to sort of create a well-rounded pad here, I'm gonna drop this down to compensate for that open space here. Okay, so whipping back around to the front here, this is the branch that I mentioned earlier that's coming directly out towards the front. I'm gonna be taking this back in and towards the front once again, just at the tip here, but my main goal here is really to shorten the length of this from the front, but also to hide this section of the branch here that's actually emanating from the front of the trunk. So because this is a conifer and the foliage stays on this all year round, what I can do here is manipulate this down and around and use this to hide that flaw. If this were a deciduous tree, we'd have to figure out another way to really eliminate the flaw, particularly if the goal was to show the tree in winter with no foliage on it. But again, because this is a, a conifer and it maintains its foliage year round, we can actually hide these flaws rather than having to eliminate them. So I'm also just removing a little bit of the foliage from the undersides of the branches here. I don't wanna strip everything off, but if there are Heavy pieces or long pieces that are dangling down, I will remove some of those. It just gives it a, a little bit more of a clean look, slightly more refined in doing that. Okay, so now that we've got that placed, we can work on the back branch here. So I'll spin this around to the rear so you can see it. Now with the direction of this tree being to the left, we need some foliage on the right side of the tree to create a sense of balance and also to create kind of a picture frame around the backside here that's going to draw your eye to the interesting deadwood here at the base. So in doing that, what I wanna make sure to do is that uh, to create a sense basically of uh, asymmetry in the tree. So I want the side on the left side to be quite long. I want everything on the right side to be a little bit tighter, more compact, closer to the trunk. So your eye really moves in the intended direction. Now another thing to think about here too, as you're placing these branches on the opposite side of the tree here, is that we don't want anything on this side to line up horizontally with anything on the left side of the tree. Everything needs to be slightly off. Even if it's an eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch, half inch, full inch, it doesn't matter. As long as it's slightly off, it creates a bit more visual interest in the tree. So in the case of this tree, we're gonna end up, let's see, we're gonna end up putting 
this branch just slightly higher than this one right here. And I think that that will look quite good. In the long run, it may end up dipping down and actually sitting between this pad and this pad right here, horizontally across the tree. So it's broken up just enough to be interesting. So that's looking pretty good there, I think. I got a little bit of depth here as well with this smaller branch that's a little bit closer to the trunk here. It's gonna create a nice secondary pad here on the backside of the tree. Now, we may end up removing some of this foliage here because it is a little bit high, the profile slightly high in terms of the volume of the pad. So I'll likely cut that back once we place the branches from above. Now, the next step is gonna be this middle section right here. Now, this is a little bit strange, but there's an overlap of the branches. So this branch that's coming out of the front here actually whips around towards the back. The one that's behind whips around and ends up over here. I want to detangle those branches. Uh, in the long run, it's gonna look better, uh, be a little bit more sustainable. So we're gonna take this long branch here and actually whip it around towards the back. And again, these things are super flexible, which makes them awesome for bonsai. All right, so get that guy out of the way for the time being, and I'm gonna take these two guys down and forward slightly so that disentangles them to some degree. All right, so I want a little motion up and down, a little motion side to side, back and forth, and then the end of the pad ends up getting lifted just slightly. So that looks okay for the time being. All right, now let's come to the other side here. We're gonna drop these guys down just a little bit as well. Again, making sure that nothing on the right side of the tree or the left side of the tree line up horizontally. All right, now we've got a, a big cavity here between the first branch and the next section of the tree in this area. So we're gonna take this branch right here and drop it down to fill that space so we can connect the bottom to the top. Now I knew that I would be dropping that branch down, so I wired this branch uh, clockwise because I knew I'd need to be tightening it and bending it in that direction. So just as a general rule of thumb, if you're bending a branch down severely one direction or the other, the directionality of the wire clockwise versus counterclockwise is very important. So the way I sort of think of this is at the end of the branch, when you loop the wire underneath the branch, we always loop it underneath so we can drop and catch the branch, but whatever direction you're looping underneath the branch, think of that as an arrow indicating which way you could bend the branch and that wire will then tighten. So I knew I was coming down and around this direction to pull this branch this way, so so I needed to go clockwise to make that happen. So that way the wire tightens and doesn't loosen as we dip it down into position. Same thing goes for applying raffia as well. If you need to apply raffia for support, make sure to do it in the same direction that the wire is going to go. So you have to think a couple steps ahead because of course the raffia goes on before the wire goes on. Okay, so the next branch I'm gonna set is this guy right here. Now, the branches just below that that we uh, disentangled a second ago, you can still see that sh sort of shoulder or elbow kind of poking out to the side here. I actually consider that to be somewhat of a visual flaw, so I wanna hide that to some degree. So this branch from above here will be perfect to utilize for that purpose. So I'm gonna dip that down. That's also going to expose these gins up here a little bit more and make them more prominent, which is quite cool. So I get two, two benefits out of dropping this thing down into this area. All right, I think that looks pretty good. So I'm gonna set this back branch, just kind of dip it down to fill some space here. And then the next branch we're gonna work on is this guy right here. Now I have a feeling that this is gonna end up being awfully long when I put it into position here, so we may end up cutting this back, which is why I haven't wired every single little tip on this thing quite yet. I wanna see where the primary branch ends up and then that will dictate exactly how, how far back we cut to push the length of this back. Now, when you're setting branches like this, you don't always have to make sure that everything stair steps back or tapers back. So in other words, it doesn't have to be a perfect scalene triangle. So the branches above don't necessarily have to be shorter than the branches down below. It's so a general rule of thumb. It's sort of a good initial kind of setup to follow uh, or guideline to follow when you're building a tree to create that scalene triangle. But it's okay to have some branches that undulate in and then come back out, undulate in, come back out. It gives it somewhat of a natural look sometimes. So we may not have to cut it back, but I have a feeling it's still gonna be a little bit too long. Let's see where this kind of ends up here. 
All right, so tentatively we've got this side set up as well. We're gonna be doing a little bit more refinement of this once I set the last couple of branches here, so keep that in mind. This is just an initial placement here. But uh, now we can move up into the upper portion of the tree. So as I mentioned before, I wanna draw your eye back down to the base as much as possible down here. So to have this stretched neck appearance to the tree really isn't an ideal situation. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna set this branch here a little bit towards the back. This is actually really a perfect situation here where we've got these two branches that originally were bar branches. Now one is going to be a lateral branch down here. The other one is going to be our apex. So we can eliminate this sort of visual appearance of it being a bar branch on the tree. So that works out quite well. Now up here at the top, I mentioned this before, but nine times out of 10, when you're doing an initial styling on a tree like this, what is the apex of the tree, the tallest point here, that terminal bud at the end, is not going to be the apex once we set this branch. Typically what ends up happening is this, gets whipped down and becomes a lateral branch, and then these smaller branches in here, maybe something like this, or a combination of a lot of those back buds, actually ends up getting built as the apex. So that's what we're gonna be doing with this tree right here. What we need to do first though is take this towards the rear, then I'm gonna whip it back around towards the left here, and then we'll fan everything out and create kind of a nice sinuous line with a somewhat rounded top to this tree. All right, so that's gonna do it for this particular styling on this Colorado Blue Spruce. We'll be featuring this tree in an upcoming episode again of Bonsai U as it develops. So we'll talk about how to pinch it, how to prune it, how to fertilize it and water it in a future episode. So be on the lookout for that. Speaking of which, if you like what we do here at Bonsai U and you wanna like and subscribe, we would love for you to do so. You can click on that button, that subscribe button down below. There's a little bell button next to it. You can click on that. That'll make sure that you get our notifications when we put a new video out. And there'll be a new video every other Thursday. So we'll have regular postings here on YouTube and on our website. And if you really like what we do here at Bonsai U and you want to support us monetarily, you can click on the link in the description down below. It'll bounce you over to our website and you can donate however much you like to help Bonsai U going forward. I want to thank you guys again for checking out this particular episode and we'll see you guys next time around. Take care.